In this video, we will discuss how to create subroutines in assembly for the PIC 16F1719 microcontroller. Subroutines are very useful if you have code that you're going to use on a regular basis. So if it's not something you're just setting up one time, if it's a routine you're going to use on a regular basis, such as putting characters out on an LCD, turning a motor at a specific speed, all those kind of things you're going to want to be able to do given certain inputs, certain values that may change, but generally structuring the code in the same way. You wouldn't want to have to write out all of that code every single time you wanted to run that routine. This is very similar if you're familiar with MATLAB with functions. Um, same thing if you're used to C programming. You write a function for code that you are going to be running on a regular basis. So what happens when a subroutine is called? Well, the first thing is the current program counter is stored on the stack. So recall that the program counter is keeping track of what line of code is being run at any given time. And that is an address in the flash program memory on your PIC. Whenever you hit a call to call a subroutine, just to remember where it was called from, that particular address in the flash program memory is stored onto a stack. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Then the program counter is changed to the address for the subroutine that is called. So typically that will be given in the form of a label and you will branch out to change the program counter to the address where that label is located in your code. Then you will start executing the code in that subroutine until you get to a return or a return with literal in W statement which we will talk about a little bit later on. Once you hit that return statement that address that was pushed onto the stack at the beginning will now be popped off and returned into the program counter. And that way your code will continue executing from the line after the call statement that initially brought you into the subroutine. And so that allows you just to keep going, branching right back to where you were after the call, and it continues execution as you would expect, one line after the next after the next. This is very similar to a go-to, however, when you issue a go-to followed by a label, it just goes to that location, but it doesn't remember where it came from. It doesn't have the ability to use the stack to go back to where it was called from. So a call is very much like a go-to, except it now has some memory about how to get back to where it was from. So it, with a subroutine, you're typically executing a few lines of code and then coming back. With a go-to, it's an unconditional branch. Um, you're not going back to where it came from in any way. So here's just the distinguishing call, return, and RETLW, which is short for return, but with a literal NW. The call actually starts the subroutine, gets you down into the subroutine's code, changes your program counter after it stores the current program counter onto the stack. Then you keep executing code until you hit a return. That's going to return back. And what that will do is pop the program counter value off of that stack, putting it back into the program counter so you can continue execution. You can also alternately, if you don't want to just return, you can return and put a constant value, a literal value, into the W register. And that allows you to understand a little bit of where you went inside of that subroutine. So if under certain conditions you want to return 1, under other conditions you want to return 2, under other conditions you want to return 3, you can return different literal values to indicate something about what happened inside of that subroutine. So if you had a subroutine that, let's say, was checking to see if a push button was pressed, you could go into that subroutine, do all the control logic to figure out if that button was pressed or not, and then if the button was pressed, you might return with literal 1, and if the button was not pressed, you might return with literal 0. And so then the value of W in the working, the value in the working register would now be able to tell you was that button pressed or not based upon what happened inside of the subroutine. So talking a little bit about the stack, you can picture them, I like to think about them as a dish dispenser in a cafeteria. So if you've ever seen one of these spring-loaded dish dispensers, you load them up and the first dish goes to the bottom, then you got the next dish, the next dish, the next dish, and you got a spring that kind of keeps them 
at basically a constant level at the top. And so when you go through the line, you go to reach for a dish. Most all of us who are normal human beings will pick the dish that's on the top. You won't pick a dish that's five down or the first dish that was in there because then you have to pull all of them out. And that's exactly how stack memory works, is whatever the last program counter value is that was stored on the stack by the latest call, that is what's going to be popped off when you hit a return statement. So this is what's known as a LIFO, or short for last in, first out. So let's go through an example of subroutines and let's see what might happen. So we're going to have a subroutine called LT on. Presumably that's going to turn a light on in response to uh, port B bit 3 being high. So in this case we have some previous code, whatever was happening before this, but now we want to check the value of port B bit 3. And if it is high then we will not skip, so we have this BTFSC, it's going to skip only if port B bit 3 is a 0 and go down to the next line, but if it is set, if it is a logic high, now it's going to call this LT on subroutine. So at that point in calling, you have now pushed the program counter value, that is the program counter keeping track of the memory location right there at the call LT on, that's being pushed onto the stack, then you're branching down to wherever in memory that LT on subroutine is that we see down below, then it's going to start executing all of the other code in the subroutine and then at the end of the subroutine it hits a return. Once it hits a return that memory value is now pulled back off of the stack. You pop it right back off the stack and you go back to the line right after the call which is now at the RL. So that is a basic example. You don't have to worry about the details of what's actually happening inside of that subroutine or what's happened before or after. But now you see how you can call a subroutine. And just like we have LT on, you can really use anything as a label for the name of a subroutine. Here's another example. We want to write a subroutine that's going to wait until a switch um, is pressed. So we have a switch that's normally open, meaning it's going to be logic zero until it is pressed. And we want to wait until this button, which happens to be connected to port B pin 6, is pushed. Now, at this point, we're going to assume that you already know how to set up the Tris B registers, the Ansel B. So this push button switch is already configured properly in terms of the ports that it's going to be connected to. Um, so you've already made it an input. You've already set it up for digital mode. So now, what do we need in this subroutine? Well, we need a label, so some name for it. We need a bit test on that desired port input, in this case port B pin 6, and then we need a return statement. So let's see that worked out. Let's first of all give it a label, so we'll just call this wait RB6. You can put underscores in the names, you can't put a space in there, but underscores are totally fine. So wait underscore RB6 is going to be the name of our subroutine, that's going to be the label all the way over to the left, and it's going to wait until port B pin 6 is pressed. We need a return statement at the end, so once we're done with this subroutine, we're going to hit that return and go back. And so down in here, what we're going to do is a bit test. And we're going to do a bit test F, skipping if set, on port B bit 6. So what's going to happen when we hit that bit test? If port B bit 6 is a logic 1, it is going to skip over that go to wait RB6, and it's going to hit the return statement. If it's not a 1, it's going to end up with that go to wait RB6, and it's just going to go back to the beginning of this subroutine and keep going and going and going and going and going until it finally does satisfy that bit test to where it can skip, and then it's going to hit the return. Now, one thing is important to note you do not want to put a call wait RB6 right in here. Um, rather we're using a go to because you don't know how many times this might happen. So if you're sitting there and you didn't push this switch for let's say a few seconds, this is going to be checked on the order of nanoseconds and you're going to be checking it thousands or maybe millions of times and every time you do that if you just kept calling wait RB6 call wait RB6 call wait RB6 you're going to be filling up your stack. Your stack only has but so much memory to hold whereas with the go to you're just going back so this also illustrates that you can use the same label as a call to a subroutine 
and as a go-to. So in this case, we're just going back to the beginning of the subroutine and we're waiting until that button is pressed. <coughs> what this is known as is data polling. So data polling is constantly waiting for an input like what we had in the, the previous case where you're basically just saying, is it set, is it set, is it set, is it set, and just waiting and not doing anything else. The problem with polling is really that while you're waiting, you couldn't do anything else. All you were doing is stuck in that loop where you were waiting for that uh, value to be a logic one. You weren't able to do anything else in the code. It really wasted a lot of time. And so the solution to data polling is to use what's known as an interrupt. And we will see an example of some interrupts in some future lectures. So here's another example of a subroutine. We want to write a subroutine that's going to blink a light on and off three times. So here's an example. We'll just call it subroutine blink. So we've got a label blink. We've got a return at the end. And what this is going to do is set port B bit zero, call another subroutine. So within a subroutine, you can call another one. And this is going to be a delay routine, which might just waste a few clock cycles, just give us enough time to see that light on before we're turning it off. And then we're going to call uh, for the, uh, the bit clear F of port B bit zero. That's now going to turn that light off. And then we'll call another delay. So the light will be on, delay, off, delay, on, delay, off, delay. So this subroutine is just going to blink the light one time. If we want to actually blink it three times, we could just call the blink subroutine here. So we're going to call blink, it'll blink it once, call it again, it'll blink it the second time, and call it again, it'll blink it the third time. This is nice and easy just to write call blink over and over again since we only have to do it three times. But you might think about having a structure where you're using a for loop to blink it a set number of times. That way you could change the value of the number of blinks. So here's an example of what that might look like where you're going to create a counter. We're going to put it in memory location 20, which is one of our registers that's freely available for us to store our own variables in. And then we're going to have, again, this label blink 3. We're going to move a literal into W3 that's going to act as our counter here. We're going to move that into a counter. And then what are we going to do? Inside of this inner loop, we're going to call blink. We're going to decrement our counter to see if we got all the way to 0. Now this is decrementing a counter or decrementing a value in a special function register, that function register being counter, and skipping if it gets to zero. So on the first pass through it, it decrements from three to two. That is not zero. Um, it does put the result back into the counter itself. So if we put comma zero, that's going to put it into W and not modify the counter itself. We do want to actually modify the counter. So now we go from three to two. That's not zero. So it doesn't skip it goes to again. So we come back in here, we call the blink routine another time. Now we're decrementing from two to one. Again, it's not going to skip. It's going to go to again. Blink the third time, we decrement from one to zero. Now it is zero. So we're going to skip the go to again and get down here to the return. So effectively, this will blink it three times. This is a little bit longer code when compared to just this. But you could easily see if you wanted to blink something, let's say 15 times, this would be much more efficient. Right here you would just change this to uh, 15. In this case, by default, the numbers are going to be hexadecimal. So you could put um, 0FH, or you could also put D single quotes 15 in single quotes, and that would allow it to be taking in a decimal value. So those are just some other ways that you could blink a light on and off three separate times. So in summary, you've now learned how to use six more pick assembly commands. The bit test f skipping if set, bit test f skipping if clear. You've used go to's and calls, and you've used returns and returns with a literal in W. Don't worry about those delay routines. We're going to get into timing and how to write some delay subroutines in a future lecture. Um, but we will see more about those calls to delay for a certain amount of time. Um, you also know how to write if statements, and we saw that in a previous lecture, so now you know how to couple that with subroutines in assembly.